Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible sermon series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Proverbs 35, every word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Deuteronomy 32, 4, for he is a rock and all of his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. So if you have the truth of the word of God, you have an absolute rock to set your feet on, to give you sure footing and allow you to be fruitful in this life for God and lead a life that's going to give you eternal rewards into heaven as opposed to uh, following the shifting sands of human opinion in which everybody's right and nobody's wrong and there are no absolutes underneath it. So you're just walking on shifting sand that's just going to lead you to contention, confusion, dead ends, strife, and ultimate judgment. You want the word of God so you have absolute truth for an absolute future. And that's why this series is devoted exclusively to it. And it's called Straight Scripture, No Sugar. So today's message is called actively waiting, actively waiting. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, scripture is full of exhortations about waiting. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and walk and not grow faint. Isaiah 40, 31, Isaiah 64, 4. Since the beginning, nobody is perceived or heard by ear or seen by eye, any God but you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good to the one who waits for him, to the soul who seeks him, okay? We're encouraged over and over and over again to wait on the Lord when it comes to uh, deliverance, when it comes to prayers being answered, when it comes to strength, when it comes to restoration, when it comes to blessing, we're called over and over and over again to wait on the Lord. However, we are not supposed to be idly waiting, okay? We're not supposed to be not doing anything while we're waiting. We're supposed to be proactive and working while we're waiting, okay? Now, Scripture talks about uh, persistence in prayer. And while you're waiting, go boldly before the throne of grace and be insistent, right? That's replete in Scripture. I mean, Hebrews 4.15 says, Go boldly before the throne of grace so that you may receive grace and mercy to help in your time of need. However, while we are being bold and while we are being insistent with God, at the same time, we are also patiently waiting and working we're very very active while we're waiting we're never idle okay so the first thing i'm going to do is address this issue of waiting in relation to the jews who were on the exodus out of egypt and on their way to the promised land to take the land of canaan okay so what happened is god led them out with great possessions he led them out with great flocks and great herds and gold and silver in abundance and garments and clothing that they had plundered from the Egyptians. And God even gave them favor with the Egyptians so they would have all the provisions that they needed in terms of clothing and in terms of material provision, okay, and in terms of livestock. They would have everything that they needed, all right? So God leads them out with abundance, and this is talked about in Exodus chapter 12. And ultimately, he shows them sign and wonder after sign and wonder to show that he's with them and going before them. Okay, there are the 10 plagues that ultimately lead to Pharaoh letting the Hebrews go. We have the plagues of blood, of lice, of hail, okay, of boils, and ultimately the killing of the firstborn and the Passover, 
which leads to Pharaoh letting the Jews go. But nevertheless, ultimately, the, the Egyptians come after the Hebrews, okay? And God parts the Red Sea, and he drowns the, whole, the entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea. We have another wondrous miracle there, okay? He provides manna and quail for them in the wilderness. He makes water come out of a rock. So, okay, the Hebrews are getting sign and wonder after sign and wonder that the God of the universe is before them and is caring for them and leading them out, leading them out of Egypt and leading them to the land of Canaan. And ultimately what happens is God actually descends on Mount Sinai. It's a frightening sight. He descends on Mount Sinai in fire, in a thick cloud of smoke, okay? And there's all sorts of smoke and thunder and lightning, and the mountain is shaking, and God actually descends. His presence is on top of Sinai, and the Jewish people are just frightened. They're so frightened that they tell Moses, you t let God, you know, you speak to us. Don't let God speak to us, because we're going to die if he does. I mean, the ground is shaking, there's lightning, there's thunder, there's a thick cloud, there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, this is a frightening, frightening sight, frightening sight to approximately 2 million or so Jews who were at the base of Mount Sinai. They tell Moses, you speak to us, you be our mediator, don't let God speak to us, we're going to die. And Moses says, don't, don't be afraid, God is doing this to test you to make sure you don't sin, okay? But ultimately, the Jews are very, very much afraid here, and God basically gives them the law. He commands it from the top of Sinai. And what happens is the Jewish nation, they all agree. They say, we will obey. We will obey with your commandments. We will abide by your commandments. And Moses ratifies it by making a, an offering and sprinkling blood on the Jewish people. Blood was a way in that time to ratify a covenant. Okay, so they say, we're going to obey the Lord. We're going to obey the Lord. All right. So ultimately what happens is Moses goes up to Sinai to basically get the law inscribed on stones and to get all of the regulations and the rules for ceremonial law and law and all the parameters for building the tabernacle and building the curtains and the ark and all the furniture inside the tabernacle, inside the tabernacle, etc. And what happens is he is up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, so 40 days and 40 nights he's up on the mountain. But the Jewish nation, they've already gotten the law, the Ten Commandments, directly from this booming, thundering voice of God that's coming from atop Sinai with lightning, with thunder, with fire, with a thick cloud, with smoke. And there was also loud trumpet. There was a loud trumpet blasting. I mean, this is a fearful sight. This is the living God speaking directly to his people, okay, in, in ways that are just overpowering and overwhelming all right so they got the commandment and they've been essentially scared straight they say yes we're going to obey the lord we're going to do everything that he says okay we agree to abide okay <clears throat> so listen to what happens after moses has gone up to commune with god and get all the details for all the ceremonial law and the building of the tabernacle and all the furnishings within He's up there 40 days and 40 nights. Now listen to how the attitude of the Jews has changed. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. And for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Exodus 32, verse 1. Okay? This happened just 40 days after they had gotten the law thundering down from God Almighty atop Sinai with these frightening, frightening signs and natural wonders. Okay? Let's listen to how flipped they are. They tell Aaron, who's the high priest, get up, 
Make us a God that can go before us. We don't know where this Moses went. All right. Now, what were the specific commandments that they got 40 days earlier? Okay. They flagrantly want to violate commandments one and two. And they also flagrantly violate commandment number four. But I'm going to get into that in a minute. Let me get into commandments one and two here. What they just heard booming from atop Sinai from the voice of God himself with these natural, natural frightening signs and wonders, lightning, fire, thick clouds, smoke, okay? Here's what God says. It's his voice. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Exodus 20 verses 2 to 5. Okay, so the Jewish people say to Aaron, make this God that will go before us. Okay, flagrant violation of commandments 1 and 2. You shall not make a carved image, okay? They want him to make a carved image for them, all right? They want him to make a carved image, all right? Flagrant violation of commandment two, okay? They want him essentially to make a golden calf, which is an image that is in something of the form of the earth below. Flagrant violation of God's stipulations, okay? You shall not bow down or serve them. Well, ultimately... That's what they're going to do, and that's what they did do, all right? Now, they also flagrantly violated commandment number four, okay? I'm not talking, it's about the Sabbath, but what the Sabbath does include is stipulations about work. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, Exodus 29, okay? So, what's going on with the Jews telling Aaron, to build this image and this God to go before them. Why, why are they doing that? Okay. Now, if they were working, if they were actively waiting for Moses to come back, this wouldn't have been a concern, would it? Okay. So here's what Aaron does, the high priest, when the people demand, make this God that will go before us. We don't know what's happened to Moses. He received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Exodus 32, verses 4 to 6. Okay, before I get into the details, let me read a couple of verses from Psalm 106 that provide a summary on their behavior here. They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. Psalm 106, verses 13 to 14. Okay, so Aaron makes this golden calf, which essentially was a bull, which is one of the gods that the Egyptians wor worshipped. So you have syncretism here. You have the Jews basically melding pagan sacrifice and pagan worship with the worship of the one true God, which is what God forbid in commandments one and two. Clearly and distinctly, you shall have no other gods before me, okay? I am the Lord your God. You don't make a carved image, okay? You don't do anything that basically would blaspheme my name by worshiping false gods. That's exactly what they're doing here, okay? And they're calling the golden calf God, okay? God is not anything that's in any sort of form on the earth, okay? God is spirit, okay? To worship God in any sort of physical form is to basically limit his omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence, okay? It's worshiping a false god. So they're melding this pagan worship 
with the worship of the one true God. Not only that, they're making sacrifices to this false idol and they're rising up to play. They're eating and drinking, okay? They're gorging themselves. They're getting drunk and rising up to play. What does it say in Psalm 106? They had a wanton craving in the wilderness. What is wanton? It means sexually unrestrained behavior. This was a drunken orgy, okay? The Jews were having a drunken orgy to this false god, to this idol in the wilderness that God had clearly and distinctly forbid in commandments one and two. Not only clearly and distinctly had he forbid it, but he boomed and thundered it from Sinai with smoke and with fire and with lightning, okay? The Jews were terrified at the time. How soon they forget, right? How soon they forget, just 40 days later, here they are, stiff-necked and rebellious and rising up against the one true God who led them out of Egypt, all right? Now, they should have been working. If they had been working, if they had been actively waiting, all right? Now, this most likely, I can't say for sure, but if they had been doing what they were supposed to be doing, if they were walking in obedience and working like they were supposed to be working, you know, they wouldn't have time to consume themselves with this kind of abject rebellion, okay? I mean, they came out of Egypt with vast herds and flocks and livestock, okay? And they had all these provisions and this gold and silver and all this clothing. They had a lot to manage. They had a lot, a lot to do and a lot that they needed to keep in order and under control, okay? And they weren't doing it. They weren't doing it, okay? They were idly sitting around. What happened to Moses? We don't know where he went here. Here, Mr. High Priest, make us a God, okay? They're basically sticking their nose in where it doesn't belong because they're not actively waiting. They're not working. They're flagrantly violating commandment number four. Six days you shall labor. Six days you shall labor. They're not working, all right? Listen to this admonition about work from Proverbs. Go to the Anno Sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 8. I mean, God implanted an object lesson, lesson into one of the smallest insects in nature about work. An ant, an ant teaches profound lessons about work, okay? The ant doesn't have a boss or a captain or an overseer or a ruler, yet the ant gathers the supplies in summer, or uh, prepares bread in the summer and gathers uh, her supplies in the harvest, okay? So the ant is always working and doesn't need somebody, you know, as an overseer or a ruler to say, get to work. The ant just does it, okay? And God teaches us, us a profound object lesson with a tiny little insect. We're always supposed to be active and working, okay? This reflects God's character. He is, in fact, a worker. We learn that at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis. In six days, the Lord God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, right? He is in himself a worker. It's his nature. It's his character, all right? We're always supposed to be actively waiting. We're never supposed to be idle, okay? We're never supposed to be inactive, okay? That basically leads to sin, which leads to judgment and leads to discipline and sometimes severe discipline. And it can be even permanent discipline with people who don't know God, who are among the flock, okay? Now, another group of people who had a hard time doing what they were supposed to be doing was the church in Thessalonica, okay? Paul was basically with them for three Sabbaths. They were very, very young in the faith. In certain ways, they were very, very faithful. And Paul basically commends them for their brotherly love, and they don't need to be told anything about that. But one of the main problems that they had is many of them were refusing to work. They were refusing to work. Um, they were confused about 
the second coming of Christ. And they thought they were in the day of the Lord, okay, the day of judgment of the Lord that was going to come on the earth because of the persecutions that they were facing. And Paul basically needed to straighten them out and say, no, you're not in the day of the Lord because before the day of the Lord comes, the Lord's going to come and basically take all of his own to be with him in heaven. He's going to descend with a shout and there's going to be a trumpet and all of those who are in Christ are going to rise out of the grave first and then those who are alive are going to meet the Lord in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, verses about the rapture. But nonetheless, what was happening is a lot of these people in the Thessalonica or the church at Thessalonica were sitting around idly waiting for the Lord to return. They believed him. He could return in their lifetime and they were just sitting around idle and causing all kinds of problems all right for even when we were with you we would give you this command if anyone is not willing to work let him not eat for we hear that some among you walk in idleness not busy at work but busy bodies now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 10 to 12, okay? A man doesn't work, a man doesn't eat. So what was happening is you had uh, members of the Thessalonica church who were sitting around, sticking their nose into other people's business, being burdensome, okay? Being a nuisance, being a pain, and creating all sorts of uh, trouble that they shouldn't have been creating if they were working, okay? What happens with people who don't work? They become a nuisance. They stick their noses in where it doesn't belong. That's what a busy buddy is, okay? And not only that, not only they be do they become troublesome, but because they don't earn their own living, they need to be supported. So it's a double negative, okay? They're a weight on the shoulders of the congregation because they're stirring up trouble and sticking their noses in where it doesn't belong. And they're another weight on the congregation because they don't support themselves, okay? That's what happens when people are not actively waiting, okay? They can become busy buddies and burdensome in more ways than one, okay? That's why it's very important to be actively waiting, actively waiting, okay? Now, Jesus also addresses this as well in the parable of the faithful and evil servant. This is from Luke 12, okay? So the picture here is a master of an estate who goes away to a wedding, and he has servants who are in charge of his estate and his household when he goes away, and there's an overseer or a manager of the other servants, okay? So let's get into it here the parable of the faithful and evil servant from Luke 12. Let your, uh, <clears throat> let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Luke 12, verses 35 to 37. Okay, this is a picture of active waiting. Okay, the master of the estate, he comes back from a wedding. The, the servants in the household don't know when he's coming back, okay? They don't know when, so they're always ready, okay? So they're always girded, their waists are girded, meaning they're dressed, and their lamps are burning, so they're on the lookout, they're on the lookout. And it goes on to say that the master could come back in the second or third watch, which means late at night or in the middle of the night. <clears throat> the faithful servants are ready, and they're waiting, they're actively waiting, okay, so that when the master comes, they'll open the door to him. And what happens? The master is basically going to gird himself and serve all the servants, okay? That's how generous God is. 
with those who are faithfully waiting and working while they're waiting. Okay, let's go a little further. The Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Luke 12, verses 42 to 44. So when the master of the state returns, okay, the faithful servant, the faithful manager and overseer, what is he going to be doing? Okay, he's going to be providing all the provisions that all his underlings need, all the other servants in the house need. He's going to be feeding them. He's going to be caring for them. He is going to be doing what he has been tasked to do by the master of the household. So when the master of the household comes back at an unexpected time, okay, he finds the manager taking care of the entire household, doing what he's supposed to be doing, actively waiting. And then what is he going to do? He's going to put him in possession of everything he owns, okay? He's going to, he will set him over all his possessions. Wow. I mean, this, this is a picture of how God is going to reward his faithful servants, how he's going to reward his faithful servants who are actively waiting for him, okay? Who are actively waiting so that when he comes back, he is going to put them in charge of all of his possessions, okay? Now, there's a picture in Revelation of basically the faithful saints, you know, were, um, the faithful saints are ruling with Christ, okay? Okay? He will allow the faithful believers to rule with him. That's how generous he is. Okay, that's how generous and magnanimous he is. All right. So the faithful servant, the faithful manager, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's providing for the entire household. And when the master comes back, he is going to be rewarded to the extent that he is going to be basically co uh, a co-regent with the master of the household. I mean, he's going to be in charge of everything the master owns. He will set him over all his possessions. Incredibly generous, incredibly generous, okay? Now, what happens if this servant or this manager of the estate decides that he's going to be idle while he's waiting? But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Luke 12, verses 45 to 46. Okay? Now, here you have the servant or the manager who is flagrantly disobedient and who is idle to the point where he's getting drunk, okay? He's being a corpulent, corpulent man. He's getting drunk. He's gorging himself on food, and he's, he's being violent and abusive, okay? Now, what happens when the master comes back and finds this evil servant doing the act, you know, the exact opposite of what he should be doing, okay? He's going to cut him in pieces, and put him with the unbelievers, okay? This is an unbeliever who is in the master's household, okay? Now, this is a sign that in the church and among the body of believers, there are unbelievers mixed in. There are unbelievers mixed in. Matthew 13, Jesus talks about this in the parable of the wheat and tares. Sometimes it's clear who the unbelievers are. Sometimes they're so skilled in their hypocrisy you can't tell who they are, but this is a servant who is flagrantly disobedient to the point where he's getting drunk, he's beating the servants, and he's acting like a glutton, okay? He's going to be doomed, okay? This is a picture of hell or damnation, okay? This is a picture of the rebel in the household of God, okay? Everyone to whom much was given, 
of him much will be required and from whom and from him to whom they entrusted much they will demand the more luke 12:48 okay god expects a lot from us if he gives us a lot he expects a lot back in return in fact he expects the return on investment in us to be compounded to be at least 100% return on investment if not more okay so while we're waiting for his return while we're waiting for our prayers to be answered we need to be proactive and working hard and making the most of what he's given us to give him glory while we're waiting while we're waiting for the answer the prayer to be answered whether it's for deliverance or it's for provision or it's for healing or it's for release from an oppressor we need to be working we need to be working and doing our very very best while we're waiting okay god expects a lot if he gives us a lot he expects a lot back we need to be actively actively waiting i mean you think about the apostle paul the apostle to the gentiles when he was in jail for his witness between 60 and 62 AD, okay, he was chained to a Roman soldier. What did he do that time? He witnessed and converted many, many soldiers in the household of Caesar. He had a captive audience. He was evangelizing them. He wrote the prison epistles, the four prison epistles, when he was chained to the Roman soldiers, okay? Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon, okay? He also witnessed to many visitors who came to see him, okay? He was very, very active, even when he was suffering, even when he was waiting for his release from prison, okay? We have to be proactive while we are waiting. Okay, another example of this is the parable of the talents, where the master of the household goes away, and he gives talents to the members of his household to do business when he is away. Now, talent in ancient times was a measure of weight, about 75 pounds, and he leaves these talents with his servants. One servant has five talents, one has two, one is one, okay? And when the master of the household returns, he basically goes to settle accounts with his servants, all right? Now, this is a prodigious amount of money, okay? So this is a master of an estate that is very, very large and, and probably has many, many verdant fields and an abundance of livestock and other servants. I mean, a talent, if you have a talent of gold, which is 75 pounds, and you take the current value of gold, which is about $2,000 an ounce, I mean, just one talent would be worth, you know, probably over a million dollars. I can't do the math in my head right now, but it's a lot of money. And one servant's given five, okay? So that's a prodigious amount of money. Another one's given two. Okay, but the one who was given five and the one who was given two, they return their investment 100%. You know, the master gives five talents to one. He says, master, your talent has earned five more. And the, master, uh, the servant who was given two gives two back and says, master, your talents have earned two talents more. Okay, and his response is excellent, excellent, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in little. I will make you Lord over much, okay? The one who's given the one talent, he buries it. He buries it, okay? And the master comes back and he tells him, I know you are a hard man reaping where you haven't sown, okay? So I buried it. And here, here, here is what is yours. It's like, oh, you know I've reaped where I haven't sown, did you? I mean... That's sarcasm. It's ridiculous. How can the servant say you've reaped where you haven't sown when he invested the talent in this servant to begin with? Okay, this is a rebellious, rebellious servant who isn't a believer at all. Okay, he didn't want to work. He didn't want anything to interfere with his lazy lifestyle. So he buried the talent. Okay, so he but basically is cast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says, you wicked and lazy servant, all right? If you know that I have reaped where I haven't sown, you could at least 
have given it to the bankers and then I would have had interest on in my investment, okay? So this wicked and lazy servant who proves to not be a believer at all buries the talent and ultimately his punishment is he's cast into the outer darkness where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's an unbeliever. He's an unbeliever among the believers, okay? He wasn't actively waiting, okay? He was flagrantly disobedient because he loved his leisure, because he was lazy, okay? Believers and unbelievers are mixed together, and these unbelievers are mixed in with the believers. We need to be careful of these people, all right? Some of them need to be admonished, okay? Some of them are just acting in sin, but others aren't believers at all, and they refuse to work, and they refuse to work for the Lord, okay? These people are a toxic influence, all right? They need to be admonished, and if they refuse to work, ultimately they're going to need to be kicked out of the church, okay? I mean, Paul warned the Thessalonians, what, he, what did he say? Now we command you, brothers, in the name of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, okay? Bad company corrupts good morals, okay? We don't want to be around or interacting with people who are not actively waiting, people who are idle. Bad company corrupts good morals, okay? Bad company corrupts good morals, all right? <clears throat> now, not only is that bad, but idly waiting, idly waiting leads to God's discipline, okay? It leads to God's discipline before ultimate discipline, okay? Now, if people are walking in sin, it's just like any other sin. What happens? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, Psalm 66, 18. So if you're waiting on the Lord to deliver you from a trial, from a tribulation, to give you provision, to lift you up out of the pit, to deliver you from an enemy or an adversary, to give you strength when you're worn out and you're depleted, but you're refusing to be active and to be working while you're waiting, God's not going to listen to you, okay? That's treasuring sin in your heart, okay? That's treasuring laziness in your heart, okay? So not only can that lead to other sins like drunkenness, like sexual immorality, like beating people, being hostile and abusive, okay? But it closes God's ears. It closes God's ears and it closes his eyes. Not only that, but it makes you weak. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Psalm 32 verses 3 to 4. So if you're idly waiting instead of actively waiting for God and working, okay, it's you're basically living in sin and it can make you feel weak. You don't have any energy. You don't have any strength, okay? You feel like your bones are basically crumbling inside of you. It's because you're living in disobedience. Not only does that close God's eyes and ears to your plight, but it basically makes you feeble and weak, okay? My bones grew old and my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I mean, basically David is talking here about hanging on to his sin, treasuring sin in the heart. It makes us weak and it closes God's ears and God's eyes to our trouble, okay? Needs to be avoided at all costs, all right? Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Colossians 3, verses uh, 23 and 24. You're working heartily, and it is about your reward in heaven, okay? When you do good work, you're going to be rewarded for it in heaven with an uh, inheritance imperishable, unfading, and undefiled. That's 1 Peter 1.4. In other words, every God-honoring work that we do on earth 
we're going to receive an eternal reward for that will never get old, never lose its luster or appeal, and never be tarnished by sin. It'll never get old, okay? It's not like the gold watch you get at the retirement party, okay? It's a permanent reward in heaven that will always be satisfying, okay? It will never go bad, it'll never get old, and it'll never be tarnished by sin. So when we're working hard, okay, we can look forward to that eternal reward, even while we're waiting on God, okay? So maybe it's the picture of somebody who lost a job and is constantly working to get another one, pounding the pavement, being proactive every single day, okay? Or it's the uh, parent with the rebellious child who's constantly trying to reach that child with the gospel day in and day out, even though that child is recalcitrant and disobedient, okay? Or it could be the wife or husband who has the spouse in the hospital who continues to work but regularly sees that spouse every day and is praying for that spouse morning, noon, and night, okay? This is a picture of proactive waiting, okay? This is a picture of actively waiting that God will honor, okay? God will honor in eternity with eternal rewards, okay? We're going to receive the inheritance from the Lord Christ in heaven. Not only that, <clears throat> as I've already mentioned, but working hard while we're waiting is a great way to witness for the gospel, okay? It's an outstanding gospel witness. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16, okay? So, for example, the individual, the executive that works at the corporation who has the spouse who is sick with cancer in the hospital but shows up every day and continues to work hard and continues to set the bar high and set the best possible example, even though their heart is broken over the ailing spouse, okay, that's a person and who is constantly play, uh, praying for God to deliver, to deliver that suffering spouse from the disease and from the illness, okay? Yet that person is constantly working and is constantly setting the best possible example, all right? That is a witness. That is a witness. People look at somebody like that and they say, how can they do that? How can they continue to be energized and proactive and setting a great example for all of us when they have this spouse that's dying in the hospital of cancer, all right? That is a proactive witness. That's letting your light shine before men, all right? And that can ultimately, <clears throat> when we're proactively waiting, no matter what the trial and tribulation is, that is a great witness for the gospel because people see distinctive behavior, okay, that is not natural to the fallen man. They see somebody who should be overcome with grief and be essentially a melting pot of self-pity, but they're not. They're bold, they're courageous. They're setting the bar high and setting a great example in spite of all their pain and suffering, okay? This is an example of proactively waiting and an example that becomes a great gospel witness, all right? And that gives that individual an opportunity to share the gospel. And every human being on the planet needs it because we're all rebels at heart. We all come out of the womb rebels, okay? There's not one righteous. There's not one. There's not one who understands or seeks after God. Romans 3.23. The heart of a fool is bound up in a child. Uh, Proverbs 22.15. We come out of the womb rebellious against God, wanting our own way, driven by our own lust, okay, and wanting to do things that will basically just satisfy our flesh. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John 2.16. That's the way any unbeliever behaves, and that's the way any unbeliever comes out of the womb. Whatever looks good, whatever feels good, whatever puffs up the pride, okay? It's behavior that is devoid of God, okay? Now, everybody who comes out of the womb 
knows there is a God because creation reveals God and the conscience reveals God. But revelation that comes, natural revelation through creation and revelation through the conscience and through our ability to reason and think is not enough for salvation. It's not enough for us to obey. It's not enough for us to walk in the way of truth and life and righteousness because essentially the mind is dead and trespasses in sin. <clears throat> That's why as unbelievers, you know, we come out of the womb, we just want to satisfy our flesh, okay? Whatever looks good, feels good, puffs up the pride, okay? So if you've ever lied, cheated, stolen anything, lusted after somebody else's car, house or wife, I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it, then I'm guilty, you're, you're guilty, we're all guilty, every human being on this planet is guilty of sin, and we need to be reconciled to the holy God of the universe, okay, to be seen as righteous by him in order for us to be saved and to see eternal life. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is filled with his glory, Isaiah 6, 3. He can't have sin in his presence at all, okay? Therefore, we need to have a substitute on our behalf, a perfect substitute on our behalf, who is 100% human and 100% God at the same time, because that's the only acceptable sacrifice, okay? There needs to be a sacrifice who is 100% man, so he can take the place of man as the sacrifice and 100% God, so he's also sinless and holy. And this is the man God, Jesus Christ. For our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us, so in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Colossians 2.9, For in him the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, okay? Jesus Christ is 100% God, but he's also 100% man, which makes him the only acceptable atoning sacrifice for sin. And when we confess him as Lord, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God, raise him from the dead, you will be saved, okay? So once we do that, the holy God of the universe sees the confessing sinner as just and righteous because he sees his son who made the perfect sacrifice for sin in our place, okay? So once we confess Jesus is Lord, the holy just God of the universe sees the confessor as just and holy for each and every sin that he or she will ever commit from cradle to grave. And that reconciles us to the just and holy God. Not only that, but we receive his indwelling Holy Spirit immediately, okay? The spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, who will guide us for fruitful, understanding, knowledgeable living for the rest of our life that will lead to eternal rewards in heaven, okay? And he will also guide us to move us to do what's right. And his word will basically be the compass for our life, okay? The word of God, okay? The word of God, which empowers and illuminates the believer through the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord, okay? And we can be assured once we are saved, and once we are walking in obedience, that when we are waiting on the Lord, okay, we are waiting on the Lord, that he is going to deliver us. As long as we're actively waiting and working while we are waiting, doing what we have been commanded to do in the work truth, which is in the fourth commandment, we can expect God to deliver us. Listen to what David says in Psalm 27. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. 
Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 27, verses 13 to 14. We can always be assured if we're walking in obedience and we're actively waiting that God is going to deliver us. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Psalm 34, 19. And in this situation in Psalm 27, David is talking about his enemies encircling him and surrounding him with false false witnesses, okay? People who want to eat his flesh, these vicious liars who are surrounding him, okay, and want to consume him, okay? He has every confidence that God is going to deliver him, and God always will deliver the obedient believer, okay? And it may seem to take forever, it may seem to take a long time, but God always comes through, I mean, for example, Abraham, he was told that he was going to um, be the son of promise and a great nation was going to be created through him that was going to bless all nations, okay? The nation that was going to be created through Abraham was going to lead to Messiah, okay? And he was promised this great nation, yet God did not give him an heir, Isaac, until 25 years later, okay? until 25 years later. Nevertheless, Isaac was born to Abraham when he was 100 years old, all right? You think about Joseph. Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, before he was sold into slavery, he had prophetic dreams about the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to him, about his brothers bowing down to him. He had these prophetic dreams in Genesis 37 of being a great, a great world ruler, okay? But that didn't take place until 13 years later. And in the meantime, he was sold into slavery and thrown into a dungeon, all right? But ultimately, it led to him becoming prime minister of Egypt, the second most powerful man in the world, okay? In the world, all right? David, he was anointed king at 16, but he had to spend years and years and years on the run from Saul, who was trying to kill him. Nevertheless, he was anointed, or he became king at 30 and was the greatest king in the history of Israel, okay? So God always delivers. He always delivers. And when we're waiting on him, we can expect him to deliver us with abundance and with great grace and great provision and great compassion and mercy. But we have to be actively waiting. We have to be actively waiting for God's blessing. While we're waiting, we are working. So once again, the series is called Straight Scripture, No Sugar, a Bible sermon series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. You can watch any of these messages online through the URL. It's getbibletruth.com. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Amen.